people haven't learned how to engage with others in a kind of humane way, which is what we want to encourage. And so it's not about subject learning. Welcome to Rethinking Education. Education's critical friend. Welcome to episode two of the Rethinking Education podcast. Ian Cunningham is, in my estimation, a towering figure of educational theory and practice. I say in my estimation because his work is not as well known within UK education circles as I think it deserves to be, partly because Ian is an educator who operates for the most part outside of the mainstream school system. However, I am far from alone in admiring Ian's work. The creator and pioneer of an approach known as self-managed learning, Ian is highly regarded all over the world for his innovative work in the field of workplace learning, as well as within the democratic education movement, both of which we will explore in detail in this conversation. To give you a flavour, Here are a couple of reviews of Ian's latest book, Self-Managed Learning and the New Educational Paradigm, which he published with Routledge earlier this year. The first review is by Michael Fielding, Emeritus Professor of Education at the UCL Institute of Education. This is a brave, life-enhancing book of immense contemporary importance. At once practical and profound, creative and deeply challenging of dominant models of education currently suffocating so many societies across the world, Ian Cunningham draws on a wide range of experience in industry and in education to explore and advocate the practicability and desirability of life-affirming alternatives that inspire hope and resolve in equal measure. And the second review is by Peter Humphreys, a former head teacher and the chair of the Centre for Personalised Education. Self-managed learning works. I have seen it in action, spoken with and heard from its students. I have seen young people destroyed by the inflexibility of the schooling paradigm rise phoenix-like to take control of their own lives and learning. However, This is not just something for those who can't cope with the schooling model. All young people should have access to this model of learning. It is logical, incredibly efficient and successful. Close quote. I am really interested to hear what listeners will make of my conversation with Ian, partly because it explores territory that we rarely hear about within the mainstream education debate. For example, one thing that some listeners might find interesting and potentially quite challenging is that Ian doesn't think schools should exist. He isn't a fan of teaching either. Ian is what you might call a de-schooler in the tradition of people like Ivan Illich, John Holt and others. Now, some people might be immediately inclined to dismiss views like Ian's as an extreme form of unguided discovery learning, or to say something like, oh, this is just a throwback to the wide-eyed idealism of the 60s and 70s, when overly permissive schools let feral children roam free and chaos ruled the roost. If this is you, I simply ask that you listen to this episode with an open mind. Ian is no armchair educationalist. He has used the self-managed learning approach with many of the largest, most successful organisations on the planet, with consistently impressive results for decades. Ah, large, successful organisations, you might think. Self-managed learning might work for adults, but you could never do this with kids, as Alan Hansen once said of Manchester United. Well, 20 years ago, Ian set up an alternative education provision, what some people might describe as a kind of unschool, in his house. You heard that right. He literally let dozens of other people's children into his actual house and let them learn whatever they wanted to learn about. 
and it was absolutely remarkable. 20 years later, the Self-Managed Learning College, or SMLC, now has its own premises in Brighton with around 40 students aged 9 to 16. Ian is currently in the process of opening a second college elsewhere in the country, as well as a post-16 college. I had the great privilege to work with Ian at SMLC for a period of about two years. Whenever I tell people about SMLC, as we'll talk about in this conversation, their jaws tend to hit the floor. The young people there literally manage their own learning. They can do what they want, when they want, for how long they want. They can choose not to do English and maths if they don't want to, although the vast majority do and go on to pass GCSEs and go on to college or to achieve gainful employment. In fact, to my knowledge, there are no students who've been there who ended up NEET, which is the, the acronym for not in education, employment or training, which is a much better track record than the school system has. And considering that it's mainly school refusers and people who homeschool who don't like the mainstream model who go to SMLC, I think that that's quite impressive. You will hear some first-hand accounts of current and former students in the course of this podcast. I understand why people find it so difficult to get their heads around the self-managed learning approach. I have known Ian for over 10 years now. I worked with him for two years and I am still only just starting to get my head around some aspects of self-managed learning and the powerful implications that I believe this method holds for potentially profoundly transforming the way that we think about school-based education and how we think about lifelong learning in the field of work and in the wider society. My conversation with Ian lasted for over five hours, would you believe? (laughs) The reason it took so long is that, A, he's really interesting, (laughs) but secondly, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't think schools should exist, you kind of have to do quite a lot of heavy lifting in order to get to the point where you can talk about that without prompting your listeners to take to the streets with pitchforks in hand. Whether I have succeeded in my attempt to stave off such an ugly scene, only time will tell. Before we start, I would like to address two minor points, if I may. First, the thorny issue of podcast length. Personally, I really like long-form podcast interviews. By far the most popular podcast on the planet is the Joe Rogan Experience, and those episodes are often well over three hours long. Obviously, I'm not comparing myself with Joe Rogan. Even my delusions of grandeur aren't quite that grand. But even educational podcasts are often incredibly long. Episodes of Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, for example, are often in the five to six hour range. I think this is absolutely fascinating. A few years ago, nobody would have predicted that the general public would have such an appetite, a thirst, for listening to three or six hour long conversations about serious, heavy topics. But people are hungry for long-form interviews about serious topics, and I think this is wonderful. Yet, when I asked some of my followers on Twitter the other day about episode length, they almost unanimously said that they wanted short episodes around the 40-minute mark, or one hour at most. That would mean that there would be between five and eight episodes just from this conversation, which I thought would be a bit ridiculous. So I've arrived at a compromise. Firstly, I've split the conversation into two separate episodes because five hours definitely seems to freak some people out and actually I've cut it down to about four hours in total. And secondly, within each episode, every 40 minutes-ish or so, whenever we move on to a new topic, you'll hear a short burst of music created by my amazing house band. If you are one of those people who like short episodes, please feel free to pause it whenever you hear the music and treat each section like a little mini episode. The second point relates to sound. I went to great lengths to obtain a decent quality of sound for this episode, even going so far as to take my spare microphone round to Ian's house. What was not in my control was that Ian's next door neighbour took it upon themselves to do some drilling in their garden that morning. Thankfully, whenever it happens, it isn't very loud 
and it doesn't last for very long. So without further ado, let's dive in. In this first part of our conversation, I spoke with Ian about democratic education, the origins of self-managed learning, and his innovative work applying the principles of self-managed learning in, as I say, many of the world's largest and most successful organizations over a period of decades. In the next episode, in what was the second half of our conversation, we will focus on the Self-Managed Learning College, certainly the most fascinating place I have ever worked, why Ian thinks that schools are such a bad idea, and why he thinks we need to transition into what he describes as a new educational paradigm. Hi, Ian. Welcome to the Rethinking Education podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Um, And I'm also a little bit daunted about it because I know that this conversation will explore some ideas that we rarely hear discussed in the debate around education, certainly in the UK. And so I'm really interested to hear what people make of what we're going to talk about today. I spend a lot of time, probably too much time, reading blogs and tweets and Twitter conversations and so on by teachers and school leaders and education researchers and engaging with various discussions and debates and so on. And I think it's fair to say that much of the current debate that I see taking place centres around what you would call the sharing of best practice, really, like how to make teaching and learning in schools more efficient, essentially. And at the moment, there's a vogue for quite traditionalist teaching methods, direct instruction and retrieval practice and spaced learning and revision techniques and a knowledge-rich curriculum. Um, And we can see this as a kind of backlash to the emphasis that was placed on skills um, under the the new Labour government in the 1990s and 2000s and what people sometimes refer to as 21st century skills and so on, like creativity and resilience and critical thinking. And, and increasingly, in the current debate, this a phrase of 21st century skills is often used with sort of scare quotes, like it's something to be mocked and sort of made fun of, like it's all this sort of woolly-minded thinking. Um, and so the debate around education, in my view, has become really quite narrow, Um, And and this is quite a recent development. In the 1960s and 70s, as you know, lots of people were writing really interesting books that explored deep, sort of profound, fundamental questions around education and schooling, stress-testing commonly held ideas and even questioning the very idea as to whether schools should exist. And, you know, I can think of books like Freedom and Beyond by John Holt, Deschooling Society by Ivan Illich, uh, Teaching as a Subversive Activity, Postman and Weingartner, Carl Rogers, Freedom to Learn. To name just a few, there were like scores of such books, as I'm sure you know, you've read many of yeah. them. Um, and I think it's fair to say that your own work is very much a part of that same tradition. Would you, mm. would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it is. It is look, trying to look at the bigger picture and and uh, take a quite a different stance in what education is for. Yeah, exactly. Like people talk about the Overton window a lot in politics, don't they? The idea that in the mainstream news media, there's this sort of like fiercely policed window of debate where some things are up for discussion and other things just aren't. Some things are considered to be beyond the pale. You can see this just by looking at the people who get invited onto programmes like Question Time and who gets to review the papers and so on. And people on the right often argue that the Overton window is too far to the left and people on the left argue that it's too far to the right. And it definitely seems to shift around over time. I'm not sure if there is an Overton window in education. It doesn't really apply in the same way as sort of shifting to the left or right. But I do think that the window of debate has become incredibly small as though these wider questions have been laid to rest somehow and now we just need to fine-tune the existing model. But I'm not sure that they have been laid to rest. And so I'm excited to speak with you and to hopefully bring your work to wider attention that I think it deserves. You've written a number of brilliant books over the years, but your most recent, which I just finished reading, Self-Managed Learning and a New Educational Paradigm, is an absolutely brilliant read. And I think that anyone who takes themselves seriously as somebody who thinks and writes and speaks and so on about education 
really should read this book and take the arguments that you make very seriously. So is this something that you also recognise, this idea that the debate has narrowed over the last, say, sort of 40, 50 years or so? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a number of ways of attacking that. One is this, because I uh, have raised this issue of a different paradigm. So what I'm saying is that the uh, the paradigm has become um, very narrow. It's a notion that school's job is just to get people up to a test and then test, pass some and fail some. So schools exist to fail people, obviously. Um, and uh, then the, the job of the teacher is to get people through tests uh, and to grade them and to pass some and fail others. And that's a very important part of what schools do is, 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 is that kind of grading process. And that then there is no other obligation on the teacher. So there's, it's, there's no other obligation to, to pay any attention to what the person would do after they leave school, um, for instance. Um, the career service was decimated in the UK and it wasn't very good anyway. Uh, and uh, when we've gone and worked in schools, that's often been the first thing we do is just talking to them about, well, what kind of life do you want to lead and what kind of and what that might mean in terms of work? And that nobody's asked them that question ever in school from I'm talking about talking with 16 year olds. Uh, and so, um, yes, yeah, so there's the, it, the paradigm is very narrow. And it is, and of course, uh, what we know from the ideas about paradigm, it's very difficult to jo jog people out of one paradigm into another one. So we, people are committed to keeping this going. Um, in in science, it's seen as a kind of the, the, the only research is the ones within the existing paradigm. Uh, and I I came across this actually as a new student in 1961 doing a chemistry degree and having someone coming along and talking about, well, uh, this steady state university, you know, and he was the uh, one of the uh, defenders of a steady state and dismissed this idea of the Big Bang. Uh, but of course, what happens is then the evidence comes along and science isn't democratic. Uh, so eventually the evidence that the universe is expanding had to be accepted. But for a long time, people fought it and dismissed the evidence. And I think the same thing's happening in education. Um, people are fighting to keep an old paradigm going that's equivalent to, for instance, what schools are trying to do and the agenda you're talking about is equivalent to, I don't know, trying to create a better stagecoach when you've got buses and trains that have been invented but are still going bad. Yeah, but it's you know, it's much nicer to have horses and it's much nicer to go, you know. So it, so or, or to, to, to make a better typewriter when we've got word processing. So there's, that's what I see as happening in education. So people are propping up what you see as a, as a failing idea. Yeah, absolutely. Because because if I I can remember being at a conference with some in a in a, a subgroup with I think were three professors of philosophy of education and they all agreed that actually education was about people becoming autonomous citizens, if you like, are members of their society. That's what education was preparing them for. So I said, well, shouldn't means and ends match in some way? In other words, shouldn't that be, if that's the end, shouldn't the means be uh, if people are supposed to become autonomous, democratic citizens, uh, then shouldn't that be the central theme of a school? And of course, they couldn't see that at all. There was no, oh, that's just bloody nonsense. You know, we, we get back. So that they themselves had no sense of a connection between that philosophical ideal and and the practice today uh, there's a total gap because clearly schools don't prepare people for uh, living in in the society that they are living in yeah i absolutely share many of your concerns around this and um and you've already mentioned a couple of things one of them being that you know this idea that schools don't prepare kids and we don't, we don't really have the space in the curriculum because there's so much stuff to cover we don't have the space or the time or the, the wherewithal to, to have those conversations. I can remember t talking with, a, a, I had a year 11 tutor group and they, they had to fill out their application forms to go to, to sixth form college. And it was like the very last day when this could be done. And there was this one boy who'd just been dragging his heels and he was a bright kid, going to do well in his exams. And he just hadn't done it. And I sort of made him be late for his first lesson and just sit down and fill out this form. And when it said, why are you applying to college? He wrote, because it's what you do when you're my age. You know, and it was like, and that was, I don't think he was being facetious. He just like, he didn't have anything else. He'd never sort of had a conversation about, about what happens next and what all of this is in aid of. And the other, the other point that you mentioned, which I think is going to be a recurring theme of this podcast, and we spoke about it in the first episode, 
is what you talked about, about how schools, you know, enforce failure. And if you just pull back from that, there's, there's this widely held misconception that you hear people talking about every, every year when the exams come out in August and they say it's unfortunate, but some children have to fail in order for others to pass, you know, or in order for the passes to mean anything, you know. And it's just such a just such a short sighted idea. You know, you really don't like I'm no good at surfing, but I, I don't have to fail a surfing exam in order for us to recognize that other people are absolutely amazing at surfing. Like you don't have to think very hard in order to realize that we it's actually deeply, profoundly unethical <laughs> that we've built a machine that generates failure. And we turn out kids every year, about one third of kids who um, you know, are getting grades one to three in the new system. And by definition, you have to resit maths and English if you fail, if, if you don't get a level four. Um, and it's just, it's just madness. It's profoundly wrong. Um, so, so we've gotten right off to, a, we've gotten in at the deep end, if you like here. Um, and, and I think that this, I do think that this conversation might be quite challenging because I know that a lot of teachers, and you mentioned this in your book, will find it really hard to entertain the idea that, that what they do every day is somehow like a bad idea. Like, I think that people are going to find that quite difficult to, to wrestle with. And so I want to sort of to, to um, frame the conversation at the outset by looking at a few sort of key ideas that you, that you talk about in the book to highlight how your work around self-managed learning can be seen in contrast to how we talk about, how we talk about learning in schools. Um, and so I know that you could talk about these ideas at length, but I'm going to ask if we can do this as a sort of like a quick fire round, just to sort of just to just to clarify the differences between these. Sort of, and there's a number of key sort of binaries um, that I think will be useful. So the first one is children versus young people. So, yeah, so I, I, I I'm not the first person to raise this, that if you, language is really important. And so to categorize a group of humanity with a different label, namely child, purely based on age and no other basis. And to, to therefore assume that somehow at 18 is a sort of magic transition. I, I wrote a, a piece a, a, about a caterpillar to butterfly on chrysalis stage, and it, same kind of notion of, of somehow that the kids are like caterpillars there, but there's no chrysalis. And, and an adult, you'll suddenly become the nice butterfly flying away and enjoying life. And so uh, that... It, it seems to me that the, the, the better language is young persons, and and uh, culturally that has been in the past a way um, for ninety eight percent of human history we've existed in hunter gatherer bands where there was not a notion of, of childhood as we have them. It's it's about there's a young person, and of course they have to learn to be able to engage with adults in the, in the society. But it's a different kind of model and a different way of thinking. Mm. I, already, that's a fascinating idea. That that's a, a word that's so commonplace as as a child or children, is actually really infantilizing. It's like treating young people as though they are different and need to be treated as different, and they are not people yet. Mm. Okay, my class versus our class. Yeah, it's it's uh, well, it starts at the top, you know, where head teachers talk about my school, uh, and that's this notion of personal ownership. So I think that once young people sort of get the notion that this is not their school, it's 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 owned by it isn't literally, of course, apart from dependent schools, maybe literally owned by the head. But um, uh, but the head is it's my school and then the teacher it's my class. So it's not our class. It's not we're not here collectively. So in the college, people are in in groups and those groups are our group and the, the, one of the first things that the group does is to come up with a name for the collective group because it's it's not the adults group. Um, and I think that whole issue of ownership then uh, leads out into all sorts of things uh, like they sound fanciful. Uh, why, do, why do kids often try to set fire to their school, you know, which happens all the time around the mm. country, arson attacks on schools. Happened at Never, my school. Never, interestingly, on libraries or parks or museums, you don't get arson attacks there. And the difference is, of course, at school, you're compelled to go there and it's somebody else's school. Um, and they don't have that view about a library or a museum or, museum or an art gallery or a park. You know. yeah. uh, so, so arson attacks are part of that notion. It's their school. It's not my school. I, 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 am a, I may be a pupil in this school, but it's... It, it's nothing to do with me. I am merely this individual who is dragooned into it every day to sit in a class. 
Yeah, yeah. It's so fascinating. I, even just in that conversation, then I just said it happened at my school, <laughs> even as you <laughs> even as you were saying that. And it, it, it's hardwired. And I used to find that a challenge at, at SMLC. I used to think about my learning group, and and you used to say it's not yours. <laughs> it's not yours. You got to say it's our learning group, and it's, it's it takes some it takes some getting used to. But I think you make an excellent point. The next one is learning versus schooling. Yeah, uh, because that's conflated. I mean, uh, that that uh, you have these weird statements from the government, uh, for instance, that, oh, so many people are uh, not in learning, meaning they're not in on a course. So, so, so there's the, the notion is that you're not learning if you're not on a course. I mean, the government says this all the time. The Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development says it all the time, you know, because it's basically uh, you're running training courses. And if you're not on a course, you're not learning. And they and those, those statements come from those official bodies, uh, which is bizarre because clearly people learn all the time, every day of their lives. Uh, good learning, bad learning. Also, yeah, but it, But we are learning creatures. Uh, this is what makes humans different from any other species, that we have fantastic learning capability. And uh, it's bizarre that, that therefore, uh, unless you're on an official course, uh, like in a school, if you're a young person, so now there's all this stuff about uh, children have missed things by by the uh, being off school through COVID. But uh, what they're missing is, of course, all the other stuff that's been learned. I mean, that that, that uh, like a lot of parents have learned that hey, it's just quite fun having being at home with the kids and helping them to learn. Yeah, uh, and that's nothing to do with schooling at all. Absolutely, I loved having having my son at home during lockdown. I really, really, absolutely loved spending that time with him. Um, and you also you, you talk in the book about there was a Guardian article about like how how early should learning begin, and it was essentially yeah. about how early should schooling begin. And again, it's, yeah. it's it's one of those things that's hardwired. People just associate like education is something that happens in classrooms, and somehow the learning that happens outside of there is is less valuable, or even as you say, like not even recognised as learning. Okay, link to that. The next one is teaching versus learning. Yeah, I mean the the assumption and schools is uh, uh, people talk about teaching and learning, but they're actually talking about teaching usually. And the assumption is if we cover this syllabus um, this, and it's taught, somehow there ought to be a 100% transfer from the brain of the teacher to the brain of the student. And, and if that occurred, then obviously everybody would pass every test they take uh, and potentially even supposed to get 100% because somehow there's an automatic transition from from the person teaching to this person called a learner. And that, uh, and then, as you said, a lot of the current work then is on how better to trick kids into, into accepting this so that the transmission works better. But since it doesn't, I mean, a good example being when uh, people challenge it, well, you don't teach English. So we go, well, all our students leave literate. But why is it that... Um, our huge prison population, one of the largest outside of the USA, one of the largest in the world, 50% of the inhabitants of Her Majesty's prisons are functionally illiterate, um, fact. Mm. And they've pretty well all gone to school. So if teaching worked, we'd empty the prisons. But it wouldn't. It doesn't work. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't learned how to read and write. And that's just madness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And the last one um, which I think goes to the heart, really, of the, of the difference between what you talk about as a new educational paradigm and the traditional model is uh, internal versus external locus of control. Yeah, I mean, this I mean, obviously uh, is a kind of complex and, and sophisticated theory, but in simple terms, I mean, with internal locus of control is it's my life, it's my decisions, I need to take charge of my life. External locus of control is is it's them out there somehow, somebody else has got to do this to me. And uh, so in simple terms, a lot of the research shows that people are, A, that schools encourage external locus of control, i.e. that it's somebody else is going to tell me, and B, that in terms of future life beyond school, uh, that external locus of control is a, is a negative. Um, people die younger. Uh, things like um, people are less likely to use seat belts if they have an external locus of control, um, less likely to use contraceptive um, uh, in sexual activity, uh, all sorts of 
research has been done separating internal and external locus of control. And what we're trying to encourage is more of an internal locus of control. And it's quite difficult where obviously people come from a system which is they're going to do it for me. And we get, um, you know, you, you, you get this in the media all the time. Well, they should sort this out. You know, or just talking to neighbours, you go down the road and there's a, I don't know, roadworks. Well, they should do something about it kind of thing. You know, at the, at, 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 there's a they out there. And of course, at one level there is, there's a government, there are there are authorities, but there's also a life. And and what, I've, what is terrifying when we run programmes, for instance, with graduates working in companies, um, they they find it very difficult to make career decisions because they've never, they never, for instance, had to assess themselves to to think about am I am I what am I good at and what am I not good at, and so they apply for the wrong jobs. Um, that happens all the time. I mean, we get you know when we've we've got jobs coming up and people sending CVs to us, and they're just daft. You know, people who've got no relationship to what's in the job description, but but. They, they. It, so somehow there's a they out there that is going to sort my life out for me. So I, I get my degree, and now everything should be fine. And of course, um, we, f- you find that there are actually uh, serious mental health problems for graduates often uh, because they've they've got through the system, and they're going. Everything should be fine. They somehow there's a they out there that's going to make my life fine, and they they get their first class honors degree, and then mm. are unemployable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, because they've never thought about well, what do I what am I good at? What do I like? What don't I like? It is about somebody else has decided these things, and I just have to follow them, and my and I'll be happy ever after. And it's a complete lie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. My wife would fall into that category. She got straight A stars in her GCSEs, straight A's at A level, a first class honors degree. And then got to the end of it and was like, I've got no idea what to do next. It was just she, like she just always thought that, that, that you say you buy into the narrative that if you pass these exams and you do really well and work really hard, that good things will follow. But actually, there's a bit more thinking to do there about like actually the good things that will follow. It's not it's not straightforward. And so so the, the work that you do takes place in this broad tradition of democratic education. Again, people, and especially in the UK, worldwide, the, the democratic education movement is in, in fairly robust health, as far as I can tell. But um, in the UK, it's pretty thin on the ground. So could you just sort of give listeners a, a brief sort of introduction to what is democratic education? Yeah, it, it, we're not, first of all, trying to replicate the way the state runs, um, although some people move closer to that. And this is about saying, well, if people are going to enter society and expected to behave in a democratic way, to 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 uh, be able to deal with the world in which they're operating, shouldn't they learn that as part of what they're doing? And also it's back to the whole notion that these are young persons. So, for instance, uh, how how do we make decisions within the uh, organization so the typical school one is of course that uh, teachers and heads and the government uh, make decisions and and um, and, th- and they just there's a sort of conduit you know there, there's some decisions made at the top about the national curriculum and then everybody else's job is merely to feed that through to not to do anything with it and it ends up with the teacher in the classroom just just doing uh, what's come through so we we, we have a view that Uh, If these are young persons, how do we work together? So, for instance, simple things like we have a a community meeting every morning at nine o'clock and it's chaired in rotation. So it could be a nine year old or a 16 year old chairing the meeting Um, because how do you learn chairing? Well, you do it. Um, So they learn by doing it. Um, But but more importantly, it's about having a, a place where everybody can discuss things. Everybody can work out. You know, how how do we make this community work? So we have a notion that it's a learning community and that um, as in any community, then you, you, you sometimes have to struggle with things. But that's part of the learning, because how are people going to come out of this place and and uh, enjoy uh, a productive, fulfilled life? So one of the th- one of the interesting things of course in school has become this notion of well you can be miserable in school but somehow you're going to be happy later on so you've had this terrible <laughs> stressful time but of course it never happens because uh, whereas we just think why can't young people be happy now so that's one of the things that, that young people say when they come 
to us is that we, we feel happy here or less anxious than we did in school. So addressing anxiety, stress, etc. And and we know back to the locus of control that the more people have a sense of, well, I can control this. But if somebody else is deciding, for instance, you've got to take these GCSEs and if you don't pass English or maths and you go on and you're going to still be taught this thing that you can't learn because you're um, dyslexic or dyscalculic, you know, meaning you can't learn maths. Uh, so the, it's it's a it's a notion that uh, we're in this together. That uh, what we're trying to do is create a way in which a, a learning community can work together, where young people can be involved in decisions that affect them, um, and that this does is consonant with quite a lot of the work on children's rights. Um, you know, the UN declaration and also the EU is just doing a, a study at the moment. And of course, not much use with us leaving the EU, but we've made a submission to them about about how we have to take seriously children's rights. Um, and the part of that is the sort of right to be consulted. But we see that as going more than that in terms of a right for people to make choices. Because, in fact, people make choices anyway in school. I mean, you know, I made choices around I don't like that subject, so I'm not going to learn it. And I like that, and so I will learn it. Um, I've been failing in, I mean, in my case in languages because I was used to do badly in that and I, other subjects I like. So I went. Uh, in other words, young people self-manage anyway. I mean, the notion, you know, they make their own decisions. So why not we engage with young people and make explicit that and have an open, uh, if you like, adult conversation? You know, what is it you want to learn? How are you going to learn this? What's and how will you? How will we help you to learn the things that are going to make your life a good life that you're going to enjoy and be fulfilled and happy? And uh, what what does that mean for us now? Uh, in into helping you to create that for yourself. So democratic isn't isn't like, you know, it's not like having a parliament, although there are uh, in India, they have quite a lot of children's parliaments that are quite powerful. And I just remember being in an Indian village and the children's parliament had, had got very uptight about parents drinking too much alcohol. And they were going to the leaders of the council and saying, like, you've got to make changes here because... You know, it's affecting our parents. So so there are places that have children's parliaments. We don't see it as a parliament. We see it more as a community meeting where, but everybody has an equal right to have an equal say. Why not? Because um, how do people, how are people going to learn to engage uh, with the political process or social processes? How are they going to engage with things in their local communities? Like in the COVID situation, you know, there's been a lot of stuff about people being supportive of each other, but in other cases, not, you know, where People need support and they're not getting it because people haven't learned how to engage with others in a kind of humane way, which is what we want to encourage. And so it's not about subject learning. For instance, one of the things is that we genuinely, honestly value every student equally because they all bring different things. And we know that in organisations, difference is better than homogeneity. In other words, the I've written not in this, this book, but in, in a previous book, a, a piece about 2008 disaster in the financial sector that was to do with well, well schooled but ill educated people sitting in rooms making mad decisions uh, uh, and not being able to connect with other people. And it's it's that sort of ability to engage with the world that is going to be really important for people. Yes. Absolutely. Like I said before, this, this very sort of traditionalist model of, of, uh, of learning that's really in vogue at the moment is all about subject-based learning. And it's sort of based on this idea that people previously sort of tried to teach things like critical thinking and creativity in the abstract. And then, you know, cognitive scientists started to pipe up and say, hang on a minute, knowledge is really important here. You need to know a lot of stuff in order to be able to think critically or creatively about that stuff, which is very sensible. But the conclusion that's, that in increasingly people are drawing is that it's therefore the role of schools is just to just to really go hard on what's increasingly referred to as a knowledge rich curriculum. And that subject based learning is the way to is the way, best way to prepare people for for the for the world in the future. And your take on this is that's totally wrong headed that subjects to be to be knowledgeable in, in subjects is not what it means to be educated. Yeah. And, and we're not dismissing knowledge, of course, our students get to know things all the time. Um, but uh, the notion that you have to know something before you can do it. I cite in the book that classic 
one uh, that was way back from Polanyi, which is riding a bike. The the if the knowledge base, what you need to know about how a bike stays up is that you need to know it's an inverse square law that the the <laughs> the, the radius of the wind of the bicycle is inversely proportional to the square of the velocity of the bicycle. <laughs> now, if anybody actually started stood around and calculated that. You know, it wouldn't actually work, would it? So the way you learn to ride a bike is you get on a bike and you basically you have role models. You know, as you can see other people doing it, you have some support, usually parent holding the saddle or something uh, while you're while you're trying to learn it or you've got, you know, stabilizers, whatever. And then you then you bike, ride the bike. You don't need to know how a bike works. Uh, basically. So in some areas, knowledge is crucial. In other areas, it would be just stupid. I mean, it's pointless. Uh, you know, if, if, if bike riding was at compulsory in the school, they'd be teaching that inverse square law and all sorts of other irrelevant facts. But of course, you'd never get on a bike because that wouldn't be acceptable because um, health and safety or whatever. So anyway, it, the, 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 this attempt to dichotomize saying, well, it's knowledge or skills is just nonsense. Um, you want to, if you want to learn to do things, of course, you need, you may need to know stuff. Um, you need to, but again, what do you need to know? Well, if you take in 10 year olds need to know about all sorts of grammatical forms. It was only like three years ago that I learned what an ellipsis was. And I've written a number of books and I've never known what ellipsis is. 10 year, uh, 10 year olds have to know what ellipsis is and, and other things. And they're, mean, they're irrelevant in terms of learning how to write. Uh, they have no relevance whatsoever. A series of authors have written to the papers saying this isn't, you know, I mean, famous authors, Michael Pogo and people like this, uh, poet laureates, you know, saying you don't need to know these grammatical forms. So that, so this knowledge rich curriculum, whilst I'm saying, yes, we need to know things, but there's certain things which are useless knowledge like that or like the bike riding formula. Uh, why drill those into people? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from my experience of working at SMLC, um, to come back to the democratic education thing, that was just such an impressive aspect of, of how the community works that it is genuinely owned by the by the students that they that they run the day, they um, they're involved in appointing, um, you know, tutors and deciding whether whether or not new students should come. So new students come on a trial week, and then there's a sort of there's a discussion around whether this person is gonna is gonna fit in here or not. Um, and even just the small things or what might seem like trivial things, but the way in which the kids all, uh, the, the young people, pardon me, um, <laughs> <okay>. all <laughs> uh, do the cleaning at the end of the day. You know, they, they do they mop the kitchen and load the dishwasher and they do the hoovering and then they get to save money on what would be spent on a cleaner and they get to spend that money on, you know, food for the food for the week and they run the budget for the kitchen and so on. So that that side of things, I think it was absolutely, absolutely amazing. And the other thing that's really interesting about this work that you do is that when you work with young people in this way, you f you find them saying things and doing making decisions that seem like it was complete anathema to what happens in the mainstream system. So I'm thinking of like examples of somebody you write about in the book, a student who worked really hard in their exams and got really good results, but regretted that they'd done that and that they wished that they hadn't worked that hard because they'd, they'd sacrificed other parts of their life. And there was another student who had, who had taught themselves Mandarin to a really high standard, and somebody suggested to them, why don't you do a GCSE in it? You'll get an A for sure, like you're really good at it. And they were like, well, why would I want to do that? I already know that I can talk Mandarin. I don't need to pass an exam in it to, to prove to myself that I can do it. You know, and I remember there's another girl saying, I had a conversation with her, she was like, I know I could work really hard and get an A, but I only need a C to get into college and I've got other things that I'd like to spend my time doing. And like I say, like for people who work in schools where the, the whole sort of system is set up to wring every possible grade that you can get out of every possible kid as though that's an irrefutable good without ever questioning whether it's even desirable or whether the, whether the young people themselves would choose that um, or that there might be another way of looking at this. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it is daft. And it's, it, and it's back to this point that, that, you know, what, what we're doing in the college is, of course, not, uh, it's not this mad free for all. It's students, young people can actually make sensible decisions. Uh, and given the opportunity you mentioned, about, we have this joint resources committee, which makes decisions around on the budget. And the budget is given to a committee of students and staff working together. And, 
uh, I remember last term we we got to, we arranged for somebody to come in and do a, a first aid class, uh, and because students figured they'd like to learn first aid, you know, when very sensible. Uh, and then there was a well, how do we pay for it? And so um, the, each group uh, we have our learning groups of six by age, so each group sends a representative to the joint resources committee. So there were six students there. And, uh, and and one group was going, oh, well, you know, parents could afford £10 each because that's how much it would cost. And another group person said, well, we could. What about half and half? The college pay £5 and the parents pay £5. And I'm sitting there going, we could pay all the £10. We've got the money in the budget. What are we doing? <laughs> and it was the students who became very parsimonious, you know, because it's like their budget. You know, it's not the college's budget. It's now our budget, you know, and. Uh, and how do we spend our budget? And as you mentioned, like over the cleaning, they said, well, we can take money out of the cleaning budget and mean that we can have free food and drinks in the kitchen. And we go, yeah, you can do that. So that's what we do. And uh, yeah, so every day they, they clean. And of course, again, that's just great for people learning how to work together, but we don't do it in an artificial way. We don't give them exercises on how to work together. We go, well, that's real then. You, you, two or three people have got the responsibility for cleaning the toilets, for instance, and they they take that seriously, and they do clean the toilets and mop the floor, etc. Yeah, they do. And they and they 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 have to work together to do that, and it doesn't always work. But that's part of the learning, you know. Is is where it doesn't work, then we get, comes back to the community. We have to discuss it. Well, it, you know, people didn't do the job properly today. You know, how do we what do we do about it? And it's and that's how people will learn that. And, and learning that kind of thing is crucial. And we know that all employer surveys in the last 20 years, every single one credible survey says that young people coming out of education don't have that sense of self-managing, creativity, ability to work in teams, et cetera, et cetera. That is, there's no survey that I've seen from employers saying, we love this knowledge-rich curriculum <laughs> and this creates the right people for our employees. They're actually saying the opposite. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and just as a final point before we move on to the next part of the of this conversation, um, the other really impressive aspect of SMLC, I think, is that through this process, the children really develop a strong sense, not just of confidence and sort of like verbal confidence and ability to sort of take their place and to have their voice heard because, for example, they all chair these meetings. But they all really seem to know who they are as people. They have very sort of strongly developed senses of identity. And I can remember talking to a, a student once from SMLC and I said, you know, what's the difference? Because I had taught her in the in a mainstream school that I'd worked in previously. And I asked her, what do you think? What Can you put your finger on it? What's the difference between this place and where we were before? And she said that, 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 that we know who the kids are here. And that at school, she described it as being like, a, like being in a sci-fi film where they're all like clones of each each other like all the boys have got the same haircuts all the girls have got the same haircuts they say the same things they're all wearing uniforms and she was like it's really weird like everybody's just the same and it feels like you don't really know who they are they're all just sort of and we know that children very fiercely sort of police one another's behavior to to, to maintain within very strict norms within schools and they conform to a certain to a certain idea of what a student should say and what's, what interests they should have and what clothes they should wear on a, on a non-uniform day and so on. And I think that that's what, what happens when you work with, with young people in this way is that they, they oh, see, I'm getting better, I'm, I'm getting the hang of this young people thing. Um, they, they, they get this stronger sense of who they are and, and, um, and that's, that's not something that can be understated, I don't think, the importance of that. No, and and that's a lot of the research again on on teenagers, as well as the point you're making that the peer group is the biggest influence on on teenagers. So again, teachers and parents delude themselves in thinking they're the biggest influence on the young people. They're not. Um, but um, what we also know is this notion of identity. Uh, it's 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 crucial at that stage in young people's development. And of course, if you you not developing the identity the school wants, which is a, a you know, someone who's good at exams, doing tests, you know, conforms. So that identity, then if, if that doesn't work, I mean, if you're one of the failures, then you've got to create some other identity, like maybe it's sport, which it is for some people, but others it's it's uh, becoming the best drug dealer or the best bully or whatever. In other words, there's a, there's a different kind of identity. 
Um, and they're real. You know, there are people who set out to be the best drug dealer amongst the young people. Uh, we know that happens in the, in the schools around here. Every school's got a problem with, with drugs. Um, and uh, so if you're not going to have an identity as as one that is ex accepted by these adults in this school, if, if you're if you're not accepted by them, then you're going to create an, another kind of identity because you just need an identity. And so uh, that's a, a big problem about schools wishing for people to be, in a sense, nice and obedient, conformist, quiet, but not too quiet. Because, again, I, I remember was doing a, a program in a school and the year head said, oh, we've given you these students to work with. Uh, six in year eight because this girl never puts her hand up in class or does anything so you know you, there's a requirement that occasionally you put your hand up in class and 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 do so it's not you know you've got to be the right kind of obedient student uh and and show your learning by putting your hand up the interesting thing by the way in the group was that uh because they all get to know each other and talk about i mean that, that her her friend in the group said you know what happens in the classroom this girl knows the answers, whispers it to me, and I put my hand up and and, and uh, tell the teacher. Uh, this girl was a highly introverted uh, girl, uh, not autistic, uh, but just very, very introverted. She just was afraid of, and probably had had one occasion where she'd put her hand up and be made a fool of by the teacher, so she just never did it again. And so the year ahead was going on, so she's not, not conforming to the requirements, you know, that that... that you're supposed to be, you know, not too not too dominant in the class, but but on the other hand, respond to the teacher. You know, so there's that sort of notion of what's required, which is bizarre. I'd like to take you back to the beginning now because it's, it seems like you sort of had taken quite a unique stance on schooling from the outset. So when we spoke yesterday, you were talking about how you had a moment at the age of five or something where you were in school thinking, this is all not right. Yeah, I, I, I my birthday's in, in February and I joined school in the January. So, and all this, the class was already formed with people who could come in September. So I was one of the few who joined at that time. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and I remember the register being taken and thinking, why are we doing this? Why are people <laughs> shouting out things? It's just <laughs> bizarre. <you know? laughs> and uh, and then the whole notion of sitting in rows and and uh, uh, it's just weird, you know, and and uh, and the, the norms of the school and. Uh, I mentioned a social anthropologist who'd done the research on, uh, you know, by by living with, as, as anthropologists do, living with working class families in South London, and then realising that a middle class child coming into a school start can start learning the subjects because it's it's an environment that they're kind of aware of. For a working class child, they have to learn the culture and the environment as well as the subjects. So there was two kinds of learning you have to learn because I was from a working class council estate in South Manchester. And it was like, this is a strange world. And even though the school was mainly from, you know, a lot of the kids from the, not every, well, there's some from posher areas, but a lot, most, a lot from the council estate where I was. And, but it, it's a diff, it's created in a certain kind of way. And I don't think people think about very much about the social organization of schools. Whereas that features a lot in my book. I don't necessarily use that label, but I'm trying to talk about, look, Schools are too big. Uh, they're organised in a certain kind of way uh, that is, is inefficient, etc., uh, etc., et and that this leads to all sorts of problems. Um, so yes, I was aware at, at that age, and then because we didn't have any books at home, um, I, I discovered the library. So that was my education was the library. I discovered this place was, was warm in the winter, which is nice. You could go in and you could read any book you want. I mean, this is amazing. You know, I didn't have to put my hand up to ask permission to do things. I mean, if I if I wanted to leave the library, I could just leave at school. You have to ask permission for, you know, you can't go to the toilet or you can't go and get a drink without asking permission. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I thought the library was a great place and that was where my education was. 
and so, and so this and this was in primary school still. So you yeah, you yeah. were sort of you were quite autodidactic from a young age. I was just wondering, like, did this come from you, or were you getting sort of messages from home around you know the importance of of education or reading, for example? Well, my 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 mother had left school at fourteen and hardly ever been to school because she was caring for her uh, disabled mother, so she was semi literate, I guess, throughout her life actually. Um, my father was the first person in his family to stay on uh, at school to 16. Um, uh, he came from a uh, working class area of Sheffield. Um, and uh, so he had a sort of notion of uh, education. And, and, and for instance, he got, he got out of the steelworks uh, as soon as he could because um, he realised that, you know, this was all going down the pan as it was during the slump in the 1930s. And therefore he'd, he'd suffered hugely in a family of eight. Um, and so his, he had an obsession with security. So naturally he joined the police because he figured that's the most secure job in the country. So he became a policeman. Um, not that it was actually the, the, the ideal career for him at all, you know, uh, but um, so he had a notion that there was something about education Um uh, though he didn't read or, you know, particularly or anything. I mean, but but um, the the family way back had it was um, like my great grandfather had um, as a guy working in the in the ship and, and he worked in the on the railways as a blue collar worker. But he he worked for the Great Western Railway. And uh, at that time, though, the railways were competing each other and they all had patents out on hydraulic brake system. And he invented the hydraulic brake system for the Great Western Railway as a blue collar worker. And they gave him five pounds in a week's holiday, which was so there was something way back of a kind of uh, about learning, you know, because um, my great grandfather clearly learned well. I think my grandfather wasn't very much into that at all and was a steel worker and I think had been in the Merchant Navy and various things uh, and died young. Um, so my father, there was something within within that of, which was a, you know, an element within a working class tradition, you know, of of education, you know, the trade unions and you had the workers' education association, things like that, and that amazing stuff up in the, in the northeast with the with the Pitman painters, you know, so ordinary working guys, you know, learn to paint, and so uh, I think he was part of that tradition in some way that that therefore. So he, th- he thought it was a good idea, but I don't think he kind of understood the education system or or what you do in a way that a middle class person would. Right. Okay. So so you were beavering away in the library, and then you passed the eleven plus, didn't you? Went to grammar school. Yeah, and that was another suddenly. Uh, this is a weird place again, you know, because uh, coming out of a working class culture, you know, just the way I talked and the the rituals and symbolisms that you use were just quite different from from uh, going into this kind of environment. And it was very strange. And I and I actually, at the end of the first year, I got into the top group. But the first year in the school was the just uh, three classes and they, they were all kind of mixed ability, except that it's a grammar school. Uh, but then they, they had a... Um, a setting system so that uh, and i remember the 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 my form teacher saying well you're not going to last in that you know it was like <laughs> you know you're not the right kind of person who who could be in the top group you know uh and that continued right through school uh you know so when you get into sixth form people be made prefects because i wasn't going to get made a prefect because i didn't have the right even though i did the things that the school said were important you know like i was quite good at exams and also I was the best swimmer in the school. I was you know, quite sporty and the school supposedly was interested in that kind of thing. But uh, that was just a con. And that's one of the things that I learned is, wait a minute, this is a con here. You know, that what we've been told about what's valued isn't actually true. Um, and so that became an interest in, not just in education and the lies that you're told, but also about uh, the nature of society. I mean, in this case, a class system, and and about how organisations work. It just seemed to me like school worked badly, and then when I got to university, I got even more a sense of, wait a minute, 
there's something about how we organise ourselves that isn't quite right. Yes. Yeah. Before we come on to the university thing, there's just a thing to pick up on there, which was that, you know, I mean, people didn't mince their words in those days, did they? Like that idea that you don't you don't belong in this class. You know, you're not going to last here. This isn't for you. But that that very much still persists to this day. I don't know if you saw this program that was on the BBC a year or so ago called How to Break into the Elite. It was really interesting and it followed a a range of of really high level graduates. They had like, you know, double firsts from top universities and so on from working class backgrounds and then finding that they just could not get a job for love nor money. And then there was, you know, kids who had been to private schools who, you know, scraped through through with a 2-2 and they got straight into an internship with Goldman Sachs or whatever and and the, the 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 language that they kept using they said that they weren't polished enough they weren't polished enough in the interview by which they obviously mean they weren't posh enough right there's a certain yeah. there's a certain like reassurance with that with that sort of that that upper class accent that you know when they're dealing with customers it's like sort of reassuring the expensive idea you know and like it's just so mad that we have this total bonfire of talents based on this on this idea as to who who gets to who gets to occupy those jobs and like you say it's a lie like this idea that if you work hard and uh, get good grades in your exams that you know the world will open its arms to you that's not how the world works and i think we do young people a disservice by by peddling that lie sometimes yeah well a good good example is the book from lse uh the class ceiling not glass ceiling but class ceiling and they have shown the evidence just of what you said that someone from a private school the one of the seven percent of the population go to School, who gets a 2-2 will get a better job than a working class person who gets a first. I mean, they've actually, they've actually got the evidence of that, 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 that um, there is that um, class distinction and it's, and it's rife through our culture and it's rife in education. We know that white and black working class boys do really badly compared with other, other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the political system, obviously, you know, something like th- over 30 of the 50 or so prime ministers that we've had have come from three schools, um, all of them eye-watering the expensive boys schools. Yeah. Um, so we know we know and we can see the problems that that causes. My goodness, you know, if, we, if we're talking about, you know, how we need there to be more talented people at the top, I think a brief survey of the world's current crop of politicians would uh, would persuade you of that argument. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, so, so let's get to university again. So you went to primary school, this is weird. Grammar school, this is weird as well. You got to university thinking, surely this is going to be fine. And then again, you were finding that this is not what you thought it was going to be cracked up to be. No. And again, it was uh, adjusting socially because I thought the thing about the grammar school was because I, I went home every day. So like in the first week, uh, I was at University College London. Somebody said, uh, let's go for lunch to an Indian restaurant. I'd never been in a restaurant in my life at 18. Why would I have been in a restaurant? <laughs> you know? uh, and I thought it was amazing, actually. Uh, and suddenly food tasted of something. I, I couldn't <laughs> believe that, that, that food could actually be enjoyable. So, I, so I, was the, I can remember that meal to this day, you know, having a lamb, half a portion of lamb curry and a half portion of rice, you know, and it was unbelievable. But anyway, so there's a social side. And then there was the other side of 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 just because I'd read uh, again, I got really interested in history and philosophy of science and read books about it when I was 17. You know, I'd, I'd, I, I was pretty knowledgeable about the philosophical basis of science. And I, I thought this is really interesting stuff, you know, what science is about and historical stuff and uh, nothing to do, of course, with the school curriculum. But um, and so I was expecting a, 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 an interesting place that you could explore ideas and just the notion that you're in a big lecture theatre with, with a uh, hundred people or whatever, you know, um, and just just seemed again a bit strange. You know, there was no tutorial system or anything. There was some notion that you would, somebody was going to be your tutor or something. But I think we saw him once in the pub, and that was it. In the, in the, in the whole first year, I was doing a chemistry degree, um, and and uh, the physics we had to do an optional physics. Well, not optional, sorry, a compulsory physics two years in which we were examined on at the end of two years. And it was like going back to O-level. So I got a petition against, you know, against the, the and of course got into trouble because I was going, you know, I'm quite happy to come and learn physics, but I'm not learning anything because I'm just doing experiments on light and lenses and stuff like this that I did in school, you know, not even at A-level <laughs> uh, because, 
if you're a physics lecturer, you know, the last people you want to teach are the chemists who are doing physics as a subsidiary subject. I mean, if you're a serious physicist, that's the last thing you want to be doing. Um, and so uh, all sorts of things like that and trying to just trying to influence the system, you know, just uh, it just seemed a bizarre place. And of course, trying to discuss, I, I mean, I didn't last at University College London and mercifully went to one of the polytechnics. Um, but even then, I like asking the professor of physical chemistry, you know, what exactly is an electron and being pretty much told to shut up because that's philosophy. And I'm thinking, well, actually, <laughs> this, you know, so just get on with the maths, you know, but I'm going, well, but yeah, but there's something there. What is it that we're dealing with here? And it's complicated and difficult and quantum theory is difficult, but the, there are people who talk about quantum theory in a serious way. I've read a lot of books since then, you know, where you can understand more about. It. But they, you, you, it wasn't about understanding; it was about memorizing. It wasn't you had to memorize all this stuff to regurgitate in an exam, but you didn't need to understand it. And I just thought, this is this is bizarre. So I, I didn't really take it seriously. I had a very similar experience. I did a chemistry enhancement course before I became a science teacher, and I asked that question, um, like, if electrons are attracted to protons, why don't they just stick to them? Like, why are they in orbit around them? Why don't they just stick if they're so attracted? And they were like, well, yeah, we're not going to talk about that. And I was like, oh, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. Uh, yeah, but it's not, it's not what you need to know. It's not, you know, it's not on the, it's not on the test sort of thing. Um, so, so you, you signed up, you started this petition. So it sounds like you were sort of starting to, to express your voice and then you became uh, involved with the National Union of Students, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, 1966 got elected onto the executive and then 68 I became the full time national secretary. So I was the first person outside the university sector to have a full time post in the NUS because previously it all been from universities and I was from the Northern Polytechnic, uh, uh, but it was a concern, but at all levels. I mean, at one level, it was a lot of the stuff in the sixties was students either you know anti-war stuff, which is fine, you know, the Vietnam War was on, uh, or how we get student a student representative on Senate. And I'm thinking, well, that's not a big deal. It's about how you change education, yeah. you know. And the only people who are addressing it were the art college students, you know, where they were they were saying. We need to think fundamentally about what higher education is about, whereas in the universities it was, uh, you know, because, again, it's a largely middle class world and it was about, well, we want representation. But basically we accept the system, you know, and I was going, well, no. And I, I remember doing reports on exams and getting into the press because of, of, of um campaigning against the exam system. And at the other end, quite practical, you know, there was no... Um, uh, health and safety in labs, uh, university labs were were outside the law. There was no, you could do anything you like in the lab, and there were dangerous places. People actually, uh, you know, got seriously injured, and there were uh, 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 deaths, in fact. And we did a joint research project with the, was the with the was the technical teacher training union, um, and um, uh, so there was things like that, you know, that was just wrong that 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 you could have an accident in a lab and there was and, and it didn't matter because there was no so it was a campaign and the law was changed so that it was now covered but um so i was kind of pretty interested in campaigning at lots of different levels but finding myself a difference from my colleagues who were also a lot of my colleagues were really only doing it to get into labor party politics um, yeah, it's often seen as a springboard, isn't it? And so that, yeah. that obviously gave you access to, you know, working with vice chancellors and, you, you know, you were yeah. meeting cabinet ministers around the time and stuff. Yeah. What was your experience of that? Well, again, that that coming from a working class background, I'd always had the assumption that these people uh, must know what they're doing and then realising that they didn't. Um, uh, I remember going to one sit-in and... Uh, I'd worked out a way that we could sort it out. I talked with the students, talked with with people in the university, and I was, um, I was meeting the vice chancellor over over breakfast. And you know, he was he was kind of falling apart. He was an ex professor of metallurgy who's going. You know, it's supposed to be my wife's birthday today, and I'd forgotten that because of all this. You know, and so he was, and he didn't. And I was trying to say, look, all you got to do is this, and we'll be sort it out. And he didn't. And then they, so they, the pro vice chancellors. 
persuaded him to go to take, you know, on a lit- litigious course. And then it just, the setting continued, you know, so it was just, but it was like, you, again, not, that clearly he didn't understand how the university worked as the vice chancellor uh, because he just happened to to land up in that post. And so, and then with cabinet ministers, you know, finding out that people had made decisions purely political basis, you know, that one particular incident being the sort of racist decisions made about um, British citizens on, in Commonwealth countries and, and finding that, that, you know, Labour politicians were going, well, you know, we have to do that to stay in power, you know, and, and knowing that they were being racist. And and so you go, ah, OK. So one of the big insights I've got, and I try to say this to people when they're dealing with politicians, remember that the politicians are only interested in power. Or at least start with that assumption. There are some good ones, but they're usually the backbenchers. <laughs> we had some very good backbenchers support. And, and interestingly, you know, the, the 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 best backbencher supporting us was a guy called William Van Stremenzi, who was a Tory um, politician uh, and who was, you know, great because he actually took any real interest. Um, and it was so you get these backbenchers, but of course, they're backbenchers. They're not powerful. Um, the ones who, who, who have, a, have principles <laughs> end up by not getting into the cabinet. <laughs> but that was important learning for me about learning in the educational world and organization. So there were the two th- strands for me in, 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 um, that's uh, taken forward to now, you know, cause I'm still interested in how organizations work and how you can make them work better and learning. And the two actually go together for me. So, so that those two strands have, have been a theme for my life and still are. Yes. Fascinating. And so then you started working. So what's, what I found really interesting about your work, Ian, is that you, you did a lot of the work that you did around self-managed learning. And um, we'll, we should probably talk about this, the, the undergraduate, the, the self-managed undergraduate degree that you, that you um, helped to, to develop. Um, but the, lots of the work that you've done in this field has been done with organisations out in the world. And you were sort of, you, you, you um, only quite lately sort of came to the idea that we want to do something with young people again. Yeah. So we'll come to that. So, so let's go to the, to the School for Independent Learning. Can you talk a bit about that and how that came about? Yeah, so I, I did a management development job in local government after I left National Union of Students and got interested in, in again, how you change organisations and how you change the nature of learning. And uh, in uh, it would have been 1973, we set up a, a team to c- create a new kind of, well, it was then as the D- Diploma of Higher Education was being set up as a two-year programme. So what we created was a dip HT for two years and then a one-year top-up to get a degree. So people could lead at the end of two years with a diploma of education, and quite a number did, and but quite a lot went on to their one extra year to do the degree, and that was great because it was a. I mean, I went to the polytechnic because the, the director of the polytechnic was the only person I, who ever came to see me to to help get sort out a problem in his in his college, um, so I'd respected him because most times I'd be going to vice chancellors and. And, and people and you know trying to get an entree to get them to do things sensible and he actually rang me up and said i've got a sitting and i don't know what to do can i come and see you and he came and sat in my office with the only person ever <laughs> from a university or college or authority at all sit in my office and say what do you think i should do and i thought this is a guy i could work for and so two years later i did and uh, we had an amazing team and we and we were based in the east end so we said, well, we do want to appeal to people in the East End. At that time, Newham had the worst uh, O-level results in the country, in, in England. Um, uh, it was the least uh, least interest in education. It was a kind of docs culture and um, totally, you know, almost totally working class. And so we're saying, well, yeah, we're in Newham. There's no point there for in, if we're going to deal with the local community, asking them to get even O-levels, let alone A-levels. So if we then just take anybody, what does that mean in terms of a program? We go, well, therefore, we can't have any notion of a standard curriculum. And at that time, there was a lot of interest in getting working class people into universities. But what then people talked about, the revolving door becomes, um, you know, it's not just an open door, it's a revolving door. You know, people come in and then they, they go out again because they can't make it in the in that world. And it's still true that working class students are more likely to drop out than middle class students. So because, again, of the cultural issues. So um, so anyway, we came up with a radical thing where we go school for independent study. We created 
uh, where we'd take anybody, they could come with anything and they could learn anything they wanted and they'd get the Department of Education. Uh, we had an interesting structure. I mean, there was, and this is the interesting thing that I would say is, it's, we were interested in structures, not in trying to control students, but providing a structure within which they could work and do things. So we created an interesting structure um, and we created what we called a validation board. And we invited all the people who'd run, um, for instance, government education commissions. Um, so we had Lord James and Lady Plowden and people like this. And their job was to, at the end of the first term to look at the plans that the students had created about what they wanted to learn for the rest of their time there. And so when we were dealing with that was then the Council for National Academy Awards to to validate this, um, what we what they faced up against was uh, Lord James, Lady Plowden, Etc. Etc. On one side of the table, on our side, and a group of people from, uh, in a sense, a bureaucratic organisation about well, we're going to validate you, and so it was no no contest. I mean, because the these people could say, well, we've looked at what the students are planning to do, and it's definitely two year uh, university standard, and so we got approval for it, um, and then there's the one year degree was then added on afterwards. Um, it had some faults in the structure, which is what started me to think of something different about the self wise learning approach. But but the great thing was that, um, for instance, we uh, we said, for instance, to the other parts of the Polytechnic, we'll take any of your people you turn away and we'll give them places. Uh, and our students had the same dropout rate as the rest of the institution. But when we went to degrees, we got a higher number of firsts amongst our students than anywhere else, even though we had, I think it was eight external examiners for the degree. Um, That's incredible. Uh, heavy duty. And again, you know, it just flies in the face of what we think of with like the whole the whole thing that where students and young people are thinking about universities. It's like, can I get in? Will I get an offer? Will I get these grades? And you were thinking from in the completely other way, which is that a degree is a standard. You need to meet that standard in order to pass yeah. it. But it doesn't matter what your starting point is. It's the whole idea of an entry requirement is really quite silly when you think about it. Um, yeah. And and that was so that's fascinating. So can we just actually before we come on to SML? So I, 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 as you remember, I interviewed you a few years ago, and I was looking at the the YouTube clips yesterday, and there was a comment on there from somebody who'd watched one of the one of the videos. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, someone called Adrian Rivers who said, "Oh yes, wonderful to hear Ian again." He said, "I was a student on his postgraduate diploma in management in self managed learning in the eighties. The course and his presence was a key point in my life." and gave me the confidence to launch my own business. Fast forward and we are now putting his ideas into practice on the team entrepreneurship degree at the University of West England. He said, best wishes and thanks. Wow, I haven't seen that, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, we, I mean, it's further down the stream. We, we, we started uh, uh, working with, a, with a post-grad qualifications. Okay, so so let's go to this this idea of self managed learning, and that although it's something that's sort of in the parlance now, that's actually a phrase that you came up with with your wife, isn't it, to describe the work that you were doing? Yeah, we did a search um, of all educational terms, and no one had ever used the term self managed learning before. So there was self development was quite big in the organisational world, uh, self directed was was around and so we wanted to come up with a term that would say look this is different it's a kind of a brand if you like uh mainly because we wanted to have some rigor because one of the downsides of what was happening in the 60s and 70s uh which you already alluded to is there's a lot of interest in doing alternative things but a lot of them didn't work and there was a lot of sloppy thinking as well um of just well we'll just remove everything so if you move the social glue, say, within a school and just go, that's it, we've, we've just abolished everything, rules are, you know, well, uh, there were certain schools did that and it was chaos because um, you do need to, to, in developing a community, you have to address that whole thing about what does it mean to, to help to develop a learning community. So so I, we were interested in in that kind of structural approach. So what we did, what... I was at the same time as working in the School for Independent Study. Um, I'd, I'd gone to the to the North East London Polytechnic as part of the business school, as it would be called now, um, and 
and because I've been doing management development stuff for two years before, I'd got in with a kind of radical group there, and we were involved with something called Action Learning, um, which was come out of the 1940s, interestingly, a man called Reg Evans. And I was involved with a program for what was then GEC, which was one of Britain's largest companies. Uh, it's now disappeared, unfortunately, but it was uh, it was a, a conglomerate of about 85 businesses. And it was developing chief executives to run those. And I was involved with that. And that was a, a another example of um, you just, there's no curriculum. You get a group of people together, uh, typically five, five or six, in what was called a learning set. And each person is then pursuing a project or doing some kind of work. Um, and that, that would be the way to develop them to be able to run a business. So the whole idea of the program was we take the tier below top level in in each of the businesses in GEC and that meant quite a lot of people and it, and I had a role therefore in, in being in what was called a set advisor that was what the, the terminology was in action learning meaning you were there to help people learn but not to teach um, and of course and a whole idea in that which I still carry through to today is that your job there was to ask questions <coughs> Well, you didn't know the answer when a teacher asks a question because they do know the answer. I mean, the example being that a teacher will say, you know, what's the capital of France? And they know the answer. So people put their hand up and say Paris. In, the, in a learning set, you're asking questions like, well, who are you? What do you want to do? How are you going to learn this stuff? What's stopping you learning it? Um, what happened there? Uh, because you don't know the answer because you're wanting to help the person to learn through questioning them and through supporting them. But until you know stuff, you can't actually respond and help so you need to know what do you need help with and of course they would be doing uh, fascinating projects and other companies actually sent people on this program so i remember having someone from uh hoover i think it was who was their sales director who was doing a project in south wales in her Wayne with the gc's what's that time television they were making black and white televisions in South Wales, and so there was a project on why this, why is this going all wrong? And so that was an example of a, a project. So there was good things about that. The downside was an overemphasis on projects, because you can learn a lot from other approaches. So one of the mistakes that sometimes people make about thinking about what we're doing is, oh, that's project-based learning. We well, no, yeah, sometimes people do projects, but sometimes people sit and read a book, or you know, <laughs> just talk to people, or whatever. I mean, in other words, there's lots of different ways you can learn, and projects just happen to be one. But the, in action learning, there was a kind of overemphasis, I think, on projects. And secondly, what they were missing was, why would you learning this? Are you, you know, uh, any kind of learning goals? And that was what we were doing in the School for Independent Study. So creating self-managed learning was putting the two together. Ah. So what we had in, in in the School for Independent Study is structures around how people plan their learning, because otherwise how could you validate someone's plans for their diploma or degree without – you've got to have some paperwork. Which So that planning piece was missing in action learning. So a lot of people would do very interesting projects, but then they'd go back into their own business and – they wouldn't be able to transfer what they'd learned from that project back into their own organization because they've done an interesting project. And But but they had addressed other things that they needed to learn. They'd learned things in the project, but they hadn't read any books or you know done anything different from doing the project. So so it was self-managed learning was the idea, well, let's have those learning sets uh, of six people who are there to help each other. Re Evans calls it comrades in adversity. You know, how do you realize that you're all got problems and you're going to help each other. His his whole notion of action learning was bring managers together and they will learn with and from each other. And that's what they need to do. And we don't need teachers and we don't need business schools and we don't need any of that. You just get managers together and talk to each other about what they do. And up to a point, that's true. But also there's, a, there's things missing from that. It's too open. So in a way, we created this. We had this other structure from the School for Independent Study. What was missing in the school for the study was those learning sets. So I started to create groups of six students and work with them and help them with their planning because a lot of the students were saying we need more structure. And what the staff interpreted as was more control. So they started to try and tell people and impose more. And I'm going, that's not the same. You know, they need more structure. 
they're quite right. People need structures in a life. You know, I mean, we all have structures to life. You know, I get up this morning and I've got a structure, uh, you know, when I shower, when, when I take my breakfast, what I have for breakfast, you know, also, I mean, it's a structure. Um, and if we didn't have structures in our lives, we go bananas. You know, we, you, you don't start don't start each day not knowing what you're going to do that day you, you you've got a structure to people have structures to their lives so yeah can, can we explore that for a second because you you talk about this very very lucidly i think and it was one of the binaries that I was going to ask you earlier but i thought i'd leave it till later in the conversation there could be this contrast between structure and control and you sometimes use the metaphor of a glass to talk about to, to illuminate what you mean by structures because people think when i when i sometimes tell them about smlc and i tell them the the, the, the young people there is literally self-managed so they can do what they want when they want for how long they can choose not to if they if they want to and people sometimes jaws hit the floor their eyes widen the first question is often how old are these kids <laughs> and you go nine to 17 and then the jaw stays on the floor because they're like what like how can this even be and so they think it's somehow like a free-for-all and like you say that it's somehow some sort of experiment in anarchy from you know that some people did in good faith in the 1970s and and you know with with bad results so could you, you use this metaphor a little bit to explain about this idea of structures and how those are manifest within this self-managed learning approach uh well often i start off with uh, before the, the i start off with the wheel as a as a metaphor because i say uh, it wasn't the person who invented the wheel who was important it was the person who invented the hole because you have a hole in a wheel, you can put an axle and do a, a wheel without a hole is useless. So it's a Taoist notion that useless comes from nothingness, mm. that abounded nothingness. This room I'm you is in is useful because it's got walls and a window and it's bounded, but there's a space in it that I can sit. If this this was full to the ceiling, which is the school model of a curriculum, you just fill up everything, you know. So this is the analogous to the yeah. so. Uh, so the same a glass. So what is the value of a glass? Well, it's a rigid structure. Uh, it's transparent. It's robust. And it's a nothing that's bounded. So you could put in the glass milk or water or uh, beer or anything you like. If the, if the glass was full to the top with concrete, it would be useless. The usefulness comes from the space that's created bounded. Uh, and we do that all the time in lots of things in 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 life. Is is bounded nothingness is crucial. So the bound first of all that that glass is rigid. So if it was made of cotton wool, it wouldn't be much use. So you need rigidity. You need robustness. Um, uh, as a scientist, I remember you know you, you it used to be if you had thick glass, you wouldn't put it in hot water because it would crack because it's not robust. That thin glasses. So actually, thinness is more robust than thickness. Um, you need it to be transparent so you can see what's in it. So when uh, so when our students plan, they have to answer these five questions that we give them uh, that are questions for them to fill their metaphorical glass. So they're saying, here's the structure is you've got five questions to answer. You can answer them in any way you want, but you must answer them. In other words, it's a requirement and uh, we have a document we send to parents which says these are the non-negotiables in the in the college. And one of them is that the students create what we call a learning agreement. And that came from the School for Independent Study. And the five questions are, where have you been? What's been your past experience? Where are you now? What person you are? And what can you do, not do? Where do you want to get to in life, in your career, or whatever? Uh, then how will you go from where you are to where you'd like to be, which is like a syllabus or curriculum? And then the fifth question is, how do you know if you've got to where you plan to get to? which is assessment, if you like. But, of course, we're encouraging self-assessment, in other words, that people, and people think through the criteria by which they judge whether they created the life that they want to create, if you, in its biggest term. So that's a structure, uh, but it's an empty structure. So, therefore, it's not about controlling people. In fact, it's liberating them. And I once wrote a piece about structures for freedom, uh, that, that you need structures to be free which can seem paradoxical, but it, it's not. Because if you just, you know, uh, tip to kid out into the road and go, right, you're free to do what you like, you know, and walk in front of cars or whatever. I mean, you know, this, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you need a structure. We have structures to life, you know, as we, you know, we walk down the road and there is a structure to to walking down the road and the road and other people. And, and you know, it, there's, there's social structures that exist uh, 
that are realities. Like I talk about community, you know, communities exist, you know, and there's a structure, but it's not the same as an organization structure. There aren't people with job descriptions and things in a community, for instance. But so, so that whole notion of how, and, the, and then the learning, we call it a learning group. We dropped the idea of a set because the notion of sets in school is bad news. So it's about selection and this is not about selection. It's about the opposite, mixed ability, if you would call it in school, because we just go, there's six of you of a similar age, therefore you, that's a group. Um, but the idea of the group is that to share and support each other, because if the biggest influence on these young people is the peer group, then how do we create a peer group which works for good rather than for ill? Because we know a lot of the peer groups that, that young people are in uh, are the ones that encourage them to take drugs. You know, we, it's a classic, you know, kids at a party and they're passing around a, a joint and, of course, you know, they join in. It, it's so, so we're saying, how do we have a peer group that, that works in, for good, how do, how, that's supportive, that helps each young person? And how do we create that group that is going to, to last over time? Yeah. Uh, that's going to engage. I love it. So it's a structure. In the in the education world currently, um, self managed learning is it's fair to say is not well represented in the education system. But in the world of work, it's absolutely pretty mainstream. And I know that so over over the years, you've worked with many of the largest and most successful companies and organisations in the country and also around the world. Would you be able to share with us some of that, some of the organisations that you've worked with and some of these sort of the innovative practices that you've seen that are happening in the world of work? Because it seems that the world of work is taking these forward thinking ideas about how learning happens much more seriously than, the, than we are in the education system itself. Yeah, I mean, since uh, what would be 1970, I guess most of my time up until uh, 20 years ago was... was um, working in the organizational world i mean i just thought education forget it it's no point it's it's it just isn't going to change i mean we did work obviously uh, uh, post-grad programs and things like that and i was chief executive of a business school but we were it was a independent charity business school not, not part of the state system although we we did an mba through the university of sussex but so it was actually relatively easy to go into organizations and and sell the approach um you mentioned about a student who was on our postgraduate diploma because what after the school for independent study i went back to the business school and created the self-managed learning program and we created a personal development division which was based on doing self-managed learning and uh so that would be providing qualifications but also we did stuff that was not providing qualifications so the very first program we did uh was i had in our the team someone who's doing his doctorate in um learning for in retirement so we we were hired by ford motor company who realized that what they're seriously doing remember this is now 19 late 1970s um previously for retirement these are mostly men worked on production line making ford cars right blue collar workers and the trip previously they'd had this boring bit about how to spend your pension and you know how to look after your health you know sort of lectures if you like mm. and i think the company realized that wasn't sensible and we could offer something a bit different so so it was forming groups of six a learning group and then each person thinking through uh what i'm going to do in retirement so these were guys who were being in their 60s, right? And they were, they're coming up to retirement. And we know from studies of in retirement, especially working class, that you, for instance, I can't remember how many years, about five years after retirement, half the group will have died. You know, because they just, you know, you finish the job and suddenly you've been working for 40 years in Fords on the production line. Uh, or even longer, and and then that goes collapses, chunk, you know, and then you know what do you do? So they were kind of fascinating things. So people, for instance, the, the men, 
realised that they knew certain things, how to do things in the household, and their wives knew, and the wives knew how to cook, and they knew how to mend a fuse. But the wife didn't know how to mend a fuse, and they didn't know how to cook, boil an egg. You know, it was traditional. You're talking about the 70s traditional family, yeah. working class, uh, you know, husband and wife. So they so they went away and, and, and agreed that the men would teach their wives how to do all this stuff. And the woman, because basically it worked out, oh, one of us is going to die before the other one. I mean, because they had to address issues like death, which, mm. again, is normally taboo in our culture. They're going to go, well, I'm going to die sometime. <laughs> and the chances are I'll die before my wife, because we know that from that, that's the odds, you know, women live longer. Uh, so I need to teach my wife how to do all the things in the house that I do, DIY stuff, and she needs to teach me how to cook. Wow. So, okay, kind of trivial thing in a way, but no one in the company never thought about that as an issue. Uh, and they came up with them themselves. So they, they created a learning agreement, like, you know, with the five questions about this has been my past experience, you know, and they realized that this is what they'd done in the home, their, their job, you know, they came out with certain job skills, you know, what, but they had to think about a future, you know, and say, well, okay, suppose you're around five years time, you know, what you're going to be doing. And so they could also plan other things that they might want to learn, you know, like they might go off and learn ballroom dancing or, you know, how to play bridge or <laughs> anything, you know. Uh, so that was the start of, that was the first program we ran. So, yes, over the years, we've worked with most of the largest UK companies, done self-managed learning programs. So I I've, I've, I've was just thinking, how do I go through the list? Because there's about, you know, got a load of number. So I said, well, suppose we go an A to Z. Well, A would include AXA, what was Abbey National in those days, Amersham International, which was a major techie company. B would be Birmingham City Council, the biggest local authority in Europe. Uh, the Bank of England, Barclays Bank, the BBC, British Airways. <laughs> and then you get to Z and it would be Zurich Financial Services, you know. And in between, we would have somebody from pretty well every letter of the alphabet. Um, and usually these would be uh, for senior leaders. But in some cases, like cable and wireless, we work with middle managers. But where I did a program with the secretaries of the board. Uh, and that was fascinating, <laughs> you know, because, again, board members have never really thought, you know, well, learn, they've learned everything they need. They can do shorthand and typing, which is what I need. But the secretaries came up with this international company, but we want to learn languages. You know, their bosses never thought about that. But, but cause they, so they, they decided they were going to learn languages and things like that. You know, yeah. and also new technology was coming in and they were going to have to learn how to use that um, with, the, with the word processing and things. And actually being able to take shorthand was going out as an ability. Um, so things that their bosses had really thought about, but they are secretary. So, but other cases, it would be senior leaders right through to we ran programs with chief executives from businesses who would who would uh, basically say, this is, there's no other environment that I can talk to about, talk with about business problems and get help get with solutions. Uh, in the book, I cited for, with the programs we've run for head teachers, just to... <laughs> Uh, which is kind of interesting because they they lap it up, but of course they don't usually think about applying it in their schools, which is a shame. But but um, uh, so what we what we what I typically do in it, I mean I've got to shortcut this a bit, but I'm working I'm going to talk with the board of a big company and I go tell me uh, what what the business strategy is, your plans, you know what you're trying to achieve around here, and they tell me that, and I go okay. You each directors, what do you bring to that? Then what you must be good at what you do. So what is it you're good at? And they tell me that. And then I say, so how come you're good at that? And they tell me all sorts of things about they travel, they had a good boss, they've been coached. Uh, only in about 10 to 20 percent of the case do they mention university, college, school, training courses, anything to do with formal education, a book even. Uh, so most of what made them effective has nothing to do with the educational world or the training world. Um, you know, management training doesn't do much for them. So then I go, so you've managed your own learning, and that's why you're good at what you do. So let's go the other way. If your people learn better, they would do their jobs better, and they would contribute more to you making more money or expanding or whatever, and they go, yeah. So that's the logic. So therefore... Let's help people to learn, but don't waste money on training courses because you haven't wasted your money on training courses. You haven't come become top leaders in the business through sitting in a classroom. 
You've learned it through the hard ways, you would say, the lessons of life, you know, and we've, you know, we've, we've discovered all the different ways that they, they've learned, you know, and uh, many of them will describe that in, in their biographies in autobi- and autobiographies, how they became effective. Uh, and so, and we know that a lot of the top leaders at the moment have you know, dropped out of business, dropped out of university or never went to university in the first place. Um, so it's not difficult to sell self-managed learning i mean my job is to go in and sell but it isn't actually a it, it's no it's no it's no brainer you know you just go well so therefore suppose we get six of your people together but not only will they learn stuff for themselves but they'll share learning across the business so that the business will become more effective this is about organization development not just individual development yeah because if you put in a group people from different parts of the business and they have to learn with and from each other or even in the similar part of the business you know that they uh, and and we've had evaluations done. We've got you know master's degrees. People have done the research projects in the book Self Managed Learning in Action. We've got uh, Sainsbury's uh, example, um, Finland to uh, the Finland Post and the S Group, which is the biggest, a big co-op. It's about thirty percent of the Finnish economy in the S Group. Um, uh, Aaron District Council. It's a case study in there. Ericsson's big Swedish company. Uh, and these are all research-based cases where people have researched on the payoff that have come from doing a self-managed learning program. So businesses know it works. It's easy to sell because you're basically saying, this is what you have to do as a manager anyway. You have to manage your own learning. Yeah. So all we're doing is, is fitting in with the way you've got to manage things. And like you say, I mean, that piece of research that you talk about where you were asking, you know, successful executives and managers and effective, successful people out in the world, what has been the most useful learning in your life? And they hardly ever say what I learned when I was at school or college or university. And that nearly all of that, that's why I'm so interested in exploring this idea of significant learning through this podcast, is that those those moments of significant learning, they can happen in schools and in formal educational settings, but most of them tend not to. Mostly it seems to be accidental. There's a conversation that they had or a book that they happened to come across that just totally changed their perspective and lots of the research that we do in schools doesn't look beyond the exam does it so it's all about what what improves the exams and like we said before we don't look beyond that but your research was looking at that process from the other end and asking really effective Mm. people what has been the most influential learning in your life and very rarely is that school-based learning which is a fascinating point yeah i mean and i repeat it all the time when we have parents and young people coming in on open days, I, that's my starting piece. Because I, because I mentioned, of course, that we I go and do that with a board, but we've done serious, you know, two-hour interviews, kind of clinical interviews with senior leaders to get the depth. Because of, often the one thing that they mention about learning was is experience, and so we have to unpack experience, and that takes time. And so you, 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 you might take up to a couple of hours with an individual to really get to the depth of, well, how did you, you know, what, which experiences were they and what did they do? And in some kinds of experiences of things going wrong, of course, you know, failure, it's very important basis to learn. Uh, so we talk about in the college, you know, it's, it's not about when you do something, it doesn't work out. It's feedback, not failure. You tried something, it didn't work. What did you learn from it? Absolutely. But there's no, no such thing as failure in a sense, uh, because, because that's, that badge is just the wrong badge to put on learning. Um, so, in in organisations, it's 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 not difficult to to, and and, and of course, I genuinely want those organisations to succeed. You know, I mean, I'm working with places, so we won't work with, say, tobacco companies or anything like that. So we're choosy about who we work with, but um, yeah. Otherwise, it's about saying, well, you know, it, our society requires organisations to work better and for people to enjoy life better it was interesting in one company for instance the group said well we've become friends uh, the it director was there because we tend to get people to do a presentation at the end of a program because we've got to say it's not just like a training course where you can go and sit in a course and then go away and nobody checks whether you've learned anything we say you have got to come back and talk to typically your chief executive or your board about what you've got from this program for yourself and also what business results they've been and when this, this group had been able to say they'd done quite a lot for the business over the program, 
But they said about being friends, and the IT director was going, well, this work is not about friends. It's <laughs> it's just about getting on with us. So it's great that you've done this work, but forget the friendship bit. But for them, they were saying, but we, you know, we've we've been, you know, I'm I'm you know somebody who's I'm a uh, uh, a guy in logistics, and I've made friends with someone in in uh, finance, you know. And but now I understand finance better, and he understands logistics better because we've been in together. And I now have connections. I have a better network within the business, which means that I get on better, but also the business is is benefited by my increased network across the organisation because I've got someone in finance, and if I want something, I can go and find somebody in finance who could help me with sorting out a financial problem. Didn't yeah. have that before. And and there's some really good examples in your book of, of innovative practices that companies have used. There was a company that you mentioned that that give their that give their new employees an exam when they arrive. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big investment bank, uh, uh, well known name, and they uh, they hire typically people often at MBA level, you know, not first degree, I and mean, they're looking for really able people and there's a lot of people who are desperate to get jobs there and so uh you know i did i've been working with them developing a mentoring program and various other things uh in terms of the development of people in that business but one of the things they did was um somebody comes into the business that as you say they get given a test and it's a very important test because it's a finance sector so there there are both the rules within the business but there are rules there are laws you know that you shouldn't break you know inside a trading and all those kind of things so they have to know both the legal and and the social context of their work as well as the business's rules so they get this test and they they can hardly answer anything maybe 10 20 percent doesn't really matter so then they're told you've got two weeks to come back and do the test and get we hope 100 percent uh, and of course, what that means is they've got to go out and talk to people, and they are often encouraged to work together. So you can go, let's just, uh, let's two or three of us go off to finance and find out about this one, or let's go over to the people in HR so that we can find out about HR rules. And and so and they take the paper, the test paper with them, so they've got they know what they're supposed to learn, and and then they take the the test as an unseen at the end of the of two weeks, they're given two weeks to, to get all these answers. Now, the traditional model in most companies would be sit people in lectures, and but then at the end of it, they don't test whether the person's learned, learned it. So, yeah, and whoever whoever reads the handbook, like nobody reads the handbook yeah. that you're given when you start. Yeah, exactly. Well. So, so it's a complete lack of rigor in 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 the training world. Um, it's a nonsense to to. Um, you know, put people through a process there. But it's, of course, just reflecting school, except that we don't have the exam at the end. But then how the hell do you know that person's learned what's relevant to the business? So we actually want to be more rigorous. Like the MBA program that we had uh, at Ruffy Park Institute when I was chief executive and we had it validated by Sussex, was a person would come up with a plan, answer those five questions. They would therefore get approval by the external examiners that the plan was okay and they had to get a hundred percent at the end and if they only got 99 percent they didn't pass now there's no more there's no more rigorous master's program in the world than that because you know i did a an ma uh in a occupational psychology department and you 40 percent you pass <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> so the paradox is that the system the traditional system is not rigorous yeah. And we are more rigorous because, we're, so first of all, it's tougher to create your own learning program than to rely on somebody else. Back to the internal, external locus of control. You're going to, if you go, well, it's the organisation's job to tell me this, so I'm not going to even think about what I want to learn. So how are they going to become an effective leader if they have that view? Whereas the toughness in like the MBA was you've got to create your own curriculum and prove that he's master's worthy. Yeah. And before you even get going on learning the stuff, you've got to first of all create the plan, prove and and get the okay from both your group and from the external examiners that this is master's level. And then it's approved, right. And then at the end of it, there's a very rigorous assessment in the learning group, which usually they record so that external examiners could actually listen to the recordings of the group to test whether the group has been effective in assessing the person at the end. Yes. So that's rigor. And, the, and, and no other master's program is rigorous. <laughs> and you're in no way anti-assessment. You make this point very clearly in the book as well. That you, but yeah. you talk about, you know, the example of the driving test, 
whereby, yeah. you know, it's really important that people are able to pass that test, but it doesn't matter what their starting point was. It doesn't matter whether they spent, you know, a thousand hours failing tests beforehand or whether they just had three drives around the block with their parents. The point is that you get to the end point and that's really important. We need assessments, you know, yeah. like this self-managed learning is not some free for all at all. Like you say, it's more rigorous in many ways. There's something else that, that, um, that really strikes me about this one of the one of the things that really annoys me <laughs> about about this sort of this wave of um of traditionalist thinking that i keep talking about is that there's this idea of that being really anti-generic like anything that whiffs of genericism is just to be scoffed at because they say it's all it's all based on domain knowledge but it strikes me that that the sml approach is pretty generic you know you're working across a vast range of companies from the nhs to the cabinet office to you know gc that you mentioned in engineering and so on and you i know you've spoken before about working with doctors and their surgeons who are talking about like very very technical things that you know absolutely nothing about but you're able to guide them through this process because it is a generic process for helping them get better at what they do um and i think that that's a really important point to make that like genericism is not something that is that is always bad you know there are examples when you know the idea that you can teach things in the in the absence of knowledge that's ridiculous but you know you don't need to know everything about how all of these companies work in order to make them more effective through working in this way no no and, and it's uh reg revens in developing action learning used to say it's the idiot question asked expertly you know when the person goes comes on like in a group uh and maybe someone's in engineering and someone's in hr and they may say but why do you do that and the person they've never thought about oh yeah i wonder why we do that um it's an idiot question but then they go wait a minute we should really think that rethink that so the idea of the peer group is that challenge and uh yeah i mean i i i, I would did work with a you know the oldest medical school in the country and with people who are professorial level and also senior administrators and yeah i didn't know the professor of infectious diseases he's talking about all sorts of stuff i have no idea about but, it's, um, but but i can ask well where's that going you know what do you what, what you need to do in your job uh, how are you going to learn that you know in that particular case the person was saying i want we're on a leadership program and then said oh well i've only led research projects so I got, okay they they went and shadowed people who are leaders in other sectors like the nhs and in nike actually because that was one of our clients and we so we said well you maybe you can spend some time with a leader in nike and they come back and they go wow that was really interesting and i you know <laughs> uh, my experience in university because <laughs> the, the people at that level of course have never been anywhere but a university and yeah and that's typical of many organizations people have only ever worked in their own sector and and it's the Dr. Johnson thing. You, you learn a lot about your own country by visiting other people. So you learn a lot about your own business by going and spending time in another business. And that is a very simple, free way of learning. Yeah. It doesn't cost you any money apart from the travel to, to the other business and spending a day with somebody else who also gets a lot out of it, you know, often because there's somebody wandering around with them who also says, well, that's interesting. You were doing that. Why do you do that? <laughs> oh, yes, that's true. I never realized. <laughs> yes. So the, this is this is a really important point, I think, that I'm, that I'm taking away from this conversation is that some, like these high level, very effective organizations, people who work in those organizations are applying these principles and harnessing this idea of like social learning and informal learning. Um, and th this idea of getting groups to work together, for example, and harnessing the peer relations for to, to be a force for good is brilliant. And it's just noteworthy that, you know, they, like, they're not talking about cognitive load theory and retrieval practice at Nike or at the Tottenham Hotspur Academy, which you, and you worked with as well. You said it's yeah. like the, the yeah. most forward thinking, the most highly effective uh, football academy um, in the country that's, that's been working with these SML techniques. Um, so I think that, that, that it's time to, to start to embrace these ideas more in education. And I know that, so, so we'll come on to SMLC. I've just got one thing. So, so through, through this time, I know that you've been involved a little bit, you know, in the educational world. There's a really interesting episode about something that happened in the 90s when, I think it was when David Blunkett was the, was the education secretary. And for a while, they were hell-bent on closing down Summerhill, mm. um, which, as some listeners may not be aware, but Summerhill is, 
you know quite a well known um uh, an alternative school in this in this sort of radical tradition that's been going since uh this was the 50s was it 60s when AS Neil set up Summerhill uh it, actually the very first school that he set up was uh 99 years ago in, nine, in, in 1921 wow about predates oh my goodness. so next year is the 100th anniversary i did not know that neil's work yeah he he was working before the war but in, at, at a different school and then it was after the war that summerhill uh Right. Okay. So, so um, David Blunkett, you, you you were in touch with this was when it, the, I think it was being run by Neil's daughter at this point, wasn't yeah. it? Is it Zoe? Oh well, yeah. Um, and so, could you talk us through that? What happened there with the with the Summerhill David Blunkett case? Um, Ofsted went in uh, with a pretty much an agenda of of uh, finding things wrong with the school. So there were a number of complaints, official complaints that Ofsted logged. This was in the Woodhead, Woodhead, yeah, days, um, and it was very clear there was a link from into into certainly the director of independent schools was involved. We know this because when it went to court, he was found out to be lying. Uh, anyway, um, the uh, the school was subject to more inspections than normal that would be one thing and secondly uh they have a a view that um classes are optional so they have classes they have a curriculum uh people get gcses pretty much around the average for the uk as a, as a school um they they finish at 16 um and there, so there was a lot about uh idleness that students were not in class and therefore were they learning anything but there was also trivial complaints like the toilets i seem to remember was a complaint um that you had cubicle toilets but were mixed well actually that's not common in quite a few secondary schools uh but they objected to that um and uh, the school uh appealed against those complaints. So that if the complaints were upheld, either the, the school had to do them or be closed down or, uh, well, be closed down because it's a criminal offence to run a school that's not registered. So if they were taken off the register, then Zoe, as the owner of, of Summerhill, could be sent to jail. That's the basics of it. Right. Uh, so they appealed and the appeal was was heard in the courts of law. There are courts in, in London with a judge and two retired had teachers who heard the appeal and prior to that the school was campaigning and doing all the usual things petitions and i said to zoe you've got to throw them a curveball to use the american expression do something that they don't expect so i said i'll set up an alternative inspection so i will get eight people who are better qualified than the ofsted inspectors uh to come and do an inspection so i had a couple of, of um, senior academics um two heads of uh, boarding schools. Uh, There's myself. There was um, someone who was a business consultant, uh, ex experienced. Um, uh, Michael Rosen, Dr. Michael Rosen, whose doctorate is in children's reading and was the poet's laureate, of course. Mm. Uh, and so we all went and spent time there, a much longer time than Austin inspectors, including one of the heads slept in overnight in the building, you know, so I was there one day and slept overnight and got up with them and had breakfast with them. I, I have to say, I stayed in the pub down the road. When I went there. <laughs> so I'm not really into dormitory sleeping things. Uh, so uh, uh, we wrote a report, you know, and I sent it to just Woodhead. I mean, and also, I mean, to be fair, he was quite good at replying because I was saying, you've said these things in this inspection. Uh, but it's justified. The Ofsted rules are that you must have objective evidence, and yet you're making statements like the children's career uh, uh, development is is um, jeopardised by this, some some sort of statement like that. And I'm going, well, what's the objective evidence? And of course, Ofsted had no evidence. It was a pure opinion, which actually, when we did the research on XP from Summerhill, yes. Uh, some of them might have not been very successful in life, but others, you know, there are people who are doctors, lawyers, um, senior academics, people with chairs, you know, who come from Summerhill, uh, jour journalists, you know, all sorts of people have been to Summerhill. So we're going, well, with our evidence, it's not the world's greatest because 
obviously the people who've kept in touch with them here are the ones who are more likely to have been successful. But it's some evidence, and you have no evidence. So the, <laughs> the, report, the report was was in breach of Ofsted's own rules. Right. Uh, so anyway, he went to, to trial. Uh, I never made it to the witness box because the, they were the government, sh- the Department for Education was shown to be lying. They had um, the director of of independent schools had was challenged by uh, uh, it's Jeffrey Robertson. Anyway, QC yeah. was saying, how come it's got these words at the bottom of this statement, TBW, and and. Because they were saying this, this the fact they had more inspections was just luck of the draw. Anyway, it turned out that TBW stood for to be watched. Right. So there was a hit list inside of uh, the, the Department for Education. It's not Ofsted, but inside the Department of Education on a hit list of people that they wanted to close or at least, you know, have a go at. Yeah. Um, and, the, and so anyway, they, they, once they'd been shown up to be lying, um, they sued for peace. And so uh, the government, number 10, interestingly, not Department for Education, issued a statement saying that Summerhill has compromised and, and uh, Summerhill didn't compromise at all. Wow. Um, the government lost. They, of course, this is a Blairite thing. Uh, with the spin, was, uh, we didn't lose. as the government's judgment, but they did. They didn't win a single one of their complaints. I love the way that, that that that's just a great example of how, like you say, to, to throw a curveball and to do something that's not expected, like writing a petition and posting it on the government website is not an effective way to, to bring about change. That's been repeatedly proven. Um, but you, you sort of beat them at their own game. I love it. And you just sort of say, like, here are your criteria. Our report beats your report hands down. You know, you yep. need to stand down. You don't know what you're talking about here. Yeah. That's great. We had someone who did 82, had done 82 Ofsted inspections who was able to say this report is breaking Ofsted rules. And he'd done 82 inspections already. He had to resign, of course, from Ofsted as a result of uh, putting his name to the report. Yes. So it's a, it's a message for people who want to do something different, you know, like Ofsted as an example. Why would a school have an, an alternative inspection to put against Ofsted inspection? Um, and put it on their own website against Ofsted inspections, which obviously where they've got, you know, notice of improvement. Uh, we've had cases where heads have been got rid of in quite appalling circumstances, trying to do something a bit more, a bit different. Yeah. A particular head of trying to, was working in an area with lots of refugee children. So there was an Ofsted report uh, like five years earlier saying, you know, oh, well, you know, English standards are a bit of a problem, but it's not. To, it's quite expected. It's um, re- lots of refugee children. Attendance is a problem because they basically they don't stay, so kids just leave and and they don't tell the school. So you know, there's all sorts of issues around that. And uh, so, so the report five years ago said this, but said you know uh, they're obviously working on it, and this is reasons. Five years later, the same report said the same information, but said therefore this school is failing, and they they fired the head. And it was they put in an executive committee, and they fired the head, but with the same evidence. But they just changed the goalposts. They just said, well, the English results are not up to scratch, and the attendance is not up to scratch, so you're failing. And yeah, it was fact. So sad. I would love for this practice to become more widespread. I, I I worked at a school where it very much felt like Ofsted came with an agenda to to put the school into special measures to sort of to make it the case for academization. Um, and it feels like there's been a number of examples that I could point to um, with people who work in other schools where it's very clear that Ofsted have gone in with a, with a, with an agenda. And this idea of running an alternative inspection with people who are better qualified than the Ofsted inspectors were to, to report on what's going on in that school... I would love to see that happening more widely. I just think it's a brilliant idea. And people people complain a lot about Ofsted um, with with some justification often. Um, and it's just a brilliantly subversive way to, uh, to beat them at their own game. And there's one more thing I'd like to ask you about before we get into, into SMLC, which is the declaration of learning. How did that come about? Oh, okay. Well, this was because of, I've mentioned, uh, in the 
work with organizations, a lot of kind of radical thinkers. And, and of course, it's a tough world. I mean, you've got to not just if you if you're running programs in August, just to look nice and all the rest of it, which the school is required to do, like inspecting a classroom. It's about those businesses are looking for business payoff. They're looking for results. They're looking for improvement. They're looking. In other words, it's it's not an easy world to work in at one level, but another level, it's great to have those criteria. Um, so it's it's uh, it's at one level easier. So. The, the learning declaration was uh, initially of eight of us, and, and, and uh, it was just one guy wrote round to, us, to the seven of us and said, we've all written books and papers. We've all published hugely. We've all got years and years of experience. And I wonder if we got together, could we agree on something about learning? So we did, and we wrote an initial one. And then we decided to add five other people to it to just extend it and then wrote a second version. And it was fascinating how um, we were able to agree because it was we were surprised and we spent a lot of time. We would we would meet for days on end talking things through and mailing stuff around. Um, and the and the breadth was amazing because you had on the one hand people who were solid university researchers who had spent their whole life in research in, in university and and hugely respected academic researchers on the one hand with chairs and on the other hand people who um were business you know worked in the business world wholly and consultants but had also written a lot and and people in between i was supposed to be in the middle because i'd been in the university world and i've been uh, you know, in the business world so i was kind of in the middle of that uh, and we found that we could agree on some quite i think pretty radical statements i mean we said things like um, well, if you've got some learning to do, if all else fails, then a course may be something you have to do. But, you know, it would be the last thing you look at rather than the first thing you look at. In other words, we weren't rejecting training courses. We were just going, well, a lot of it was about saying, look, learning to learn is, is the key. Um, that, that society needs people who've learned how to learn. That societies require that. Communities, organizations don't work unless people know how to learn. End of story. You know, I mean, it's like learning is central to our humanity, you know, that, 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 uh, and therefore supporting the learning of people. And we talked about learning being best self managed, of course, in it. But there was a lot of, you know, a lot of good stuff. And we talked about at a national level, you know, unless the people, national, unless a country is learning, you know, we are, we, and, and I take it right, right now, um, if we were, if people are going to solve, the problem of of the environment and the ecology, because because schools teach people to be unecological and unsystemic, we can't solve the problem, which is a systemic problem about what we're doing to the planet. And so it's that kind of learning that we're talking about. So we try to raise the whole profile that if we're going to save the world from destruction, people have to learn differently. And if we don't learn, then we are going to hell in a handcart. Well, there you have it. This seems to me to be an excellent place to pause this conversation for now and to draw this episode to a close. At the start of this conversation, you may recall that we spoke about the idea of the Overton window, the window of acceptable debate, if you like, and how one of the aims of this podcast is to see whether we might be able to widen the debate around education. With this in mind, before we hear the second half of my conversation with Ian, I've decided that the next episode of the podcast will be a kind of short sorbet course, an incredible piece of writing by Carl Rogers. It's actually a speech that he gave at Harvard University in 1952, I believe, which I hope will serve as a crowbar or potentially even a stick of dynamite in getting that Overton window nice and wide. I hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as I did. I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to drop me a line or comment or rate it or whatever it is that you can do on the many millions of channels and portals through which you can access this podcast. I look forward to seeing you back here for the second part of my conversation with Ian after our explosive sorbet course. Time is a measure of change